We'll get a second. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is Emilio Bruno. I'm a member of the Board of uh, Directors here at Dryad and a faculty member at the University of Florida and also Editor-in-Chief of the Journal Biotropica. Um, and I have um, the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker today, um, Dr. Brian Nosek from the uh, Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia, um, and notably the director of the Center for Open Science. Um, this is a nonprofit uh, technology startup that aims to increase uh, openness, integrity, and reproducibility of scientific research. Um, Brian is also the co-founder of uh, Project Implicit, um, uh, which is uh, a really remarkable. If you get a chance, um, I highly suggest going to the biography and um, um, diving into Project Implicit and maybe taking a couple of those tests yourself, eye-opening. Um, Ken Steve is a psychologist, and um, if you get a chance to talk later with Brian about some of the initial um, both uh, frustrations and uh, motivations for starting the Center for Open Science, I think it'll be a really eye-opening conversation. Um, for me, it's been really inspiring to learn a little bit about um, the Center for Open Science and the things that they've done about encouraging not only transparency, but also reproducibility and utility of data in, in creative and innovative ways that I think we could all um, learn a lot from. So I'm very excited that we've had the opportunity um, to uh, have him come and speak to us here today um, on improving openness and reproducibility of scientific research. Brian, please take it away. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm very pleased uh, to be able to present. Uh, my area of research interest uh, in my laboratory is on the gap between values and practices, what we think we should do, what we're trying to do, what we would like to do versus what we actually do. Uh, and the, the, I've been on uh, extended leave from the university for two years, and I have a three-year extension to do the, the Center for Open Science, which is a practical application uh, of that research just on the gap between scientific values and the daily scientific practices. So what I'd like to do is give you sort of an introduction to what it is we're trying to do at the center and, and sort of how we're doing our work, uh, starting from the perspective of the everyday researcher uh, and the concerns in the research community for how research is getting done and the credibility and reliability of that research, and then pulling back to uh, the various stakeholders and contributors to uh, scientific research, repositories, libraries, publishers, journals, and otherwise, and different ways that the incentives might get nudged in order to facilitate researchers behaving in line uh, with the values that they espouse for how science uh, ought to be done. Uh, and this uh, starts from uh, an emerging concern over the last few years uh, over the state of reproducibility of the published research literature. Uh, there were a number of articles. These two came out in 2011 in Nature. Uh, evaluating the reproducibility of research in cell or particularly cancer biology and finding that very few uh, original published articles were uh, replication teams from industry able to reproduce those results. They're saying we can't rely on the published literature. What are we going to rely on to transition preclinical work uh, into clinical applications for pharmaceuticals and other interventions for uh, reducing cancer? Uh, but it's not just in that field that these conversations have been coming up. In fact, uh, this conversation about challenges to reproducibility has been something that has been part of the scientific conversation since the 1950s uh, and just sort of popped its head up every 10 or 12 years, uh, but in a localized way, uh, in a particular discipline for a period of time. And what has changed in the last few years is that this has been a pervasive conversation. Many disciplines are talking about the exact same issues at the same time, uh, and it's having, it's having broader implications than just among uh, researchers themselves. Uh, and so I want to give you a couple of examples of some research that our team has been doing uh, that's related to these reproducibility challenges to just give you a sense uh, of what uh, kinds of challenges there are. So what I'm showing you here uh, is a plot of 29 uh, independent teams that were investigating the same research question. Uh, the question that they were studying is uh, is uh, a player's, a soccer player's skin tone predictive of their likelihood of getting a red card? 
uh, do darker skin tone players get more red cards than lighter skin tone players? So that was a research question that these 29 different teams were investigating. What you're seeing on the plot here uh, is the dotted line going straight up is an uh, effect size of one in odds ratio. So no effect. There's no relationship between skin tone and likelihood of a red card. Whereas higher positive values moving further to the right on the x-axis are indications of uh, there being a positive effect, darker skin tone leading to greater red cards. And so the 29 different teams are shown in the rows, and the dot is the mean estimate in effect size that each team got. And then the confidence interval is the 95% confidence interval of that estimate uh, for that particular team. So in the sort of the standard way in which research data are interpreted, if the confidence interval overlaps the dotted line, then you would say that's a null result. There isn't an effect there. Uh, at least we can't confidently rule out uh, the null hypothesis or say that these data are unlikely given the null hypothesis. And what you can see among, across these 29 different teams is that there's a good deal of variability uh, in the results that they have seen. Some of them show positive results. The confidence intervals are away from the dotted line. Other ones show overlapping with the dotted line. Well, that's all well and fine in the sense that different research teams investigating a question uh, all tend to find different results given different parts of the research that they're doing or different samples that they have or whatever. What's unique about this particular data collection is that all 29 teams were using the same data set. So we packaged up a data set, gave it to every team, and said analyze it in order to try to answer this question. And this is the variation in the results where they got with the same data. Right? And that's because there are many choices that researchers make when they're analyzing their data for what, how to draw a conclusion, which covariates to include, which models to include, which adjustments, what exclusions. And those choices have implications for the results. Any standard paper will have just one of those, but there is substantial variation depending on what the choices of that individual team have, what choices they make. So if those data are not available, if they're only available for that one team, then the one result is the result. But if those data are available to many teams, then you can actually represent the variation uh, in conclusions that people might draw with the same data given the different choices. And then the debate can be about the choices people are making and how they analyze the data rather than is that real or is that not real. Okay, so that's one example. A second example is a large project that we have just uh, wrapped up. It's been the last three and a half years we've been doing this project to try to replicate a sample of studies uh, from the psychological literature. So we identified three journals. Uh, these are three prominent journals uh, in psychology uh, and a, a set of articles from the 2008 issues of those journals and made those articles available uh, to the community and it was a crowdsource project. Different teams, different labs could volunteer themselves to try to replicate uh, individual results, with the goal being to try to estimate the reproducibility of psychological science. If we take what is effectively a random sample, not quite random, but a, a structured, stratified sample of articles, uh, how many of them can we reproduce uh, the original results? Uh, and there were a number of features, just to give you a sense of, of the project. There's, uh, of the paper, there are 20, 270 co-authors and 85 others that contributed, uh, and 100 replications were completed. Uh, and there were a number of things in the, in the protocol for how these replications get done to try to make sure that they are at maximum quality. So each uh, project had to have high statistical power, a good sensitivity to detect the original effect at the original effect size if it's there. Uh, they had to contact the original teams to try to get their materials uh, in order to use the same uh, stuff uh, in conducting the study. Uh, they had a replication protocol that they had to go through, which involved a review process, both internally sending it to another team to have them review it and back to the original authors to have them review the design and protocol in order to make sure that it is effective. Uh, and then everything, the data, the materials, everything had to be publicly reported uh, so for accountability to the, the community. So uh, the, uh, what we observed in this is that uh, here are, is a um, density plot, a violin plot, it's called, of p-values of the original studies. So in the original research, uh, that dotted line at the base there uh, is the p.05 threshold, what is usually considered statistical significance. You want to get below 0.05 to have some confidence that you have a positive result. 
And it is basically, this is just showing what everyone knows, is that basically to get a, a study published, you have to have it be a positive result. 97% 97 of the original studies found a positive result of a relationship between whatever they were studying. There were three null effects uh, that were the key results of those original papers. So the question is, what proportion of the replications in one way of evaluating replication is how many of the replications do we get P less than 0.05 in the same direction? There are many ways to evaluate reproducibility. This is just one. Uh, and this is what we observed. You can't see the number up there, but it's 37% uh, of the original results were reproduced uh, in the replications, which is less, you might compute yourself. In your uh, so another way of looking at reproducibility is not at p-values, but at effect sizes. So we took all of these effect sizes and converted them to a, the same units uh, in a correlation coefficient. And so you're seeing the violin plot here of the effect sizes of the original studies, with the estimate being about 0.39 or something. You can't quite see what the number is. Uh, and then the replications, we see the following. So there is, uh, it's actually half the magnitude of the original results uh, were the replication studies of the same studies. Uh, so these, um, oh, and I can just show you one more plot just so you can see the original effect sizes on the x-axis against the replication effect sizes on the y-axis. And if you were to get, reproduce the same effect size, get the same magnitude in the replication as in the original, it would be right on the gray line uh, that is the diagonal. Uh, but you can see that more than 80% of the replications uh, got an effect size that's somewhat small uh, to some degree. So these are just data that illustrate that reproducibility is not easy. Uh, and there's many potential reasons for lack of reproducibility, and we can talk more about some of those. Uh, but even though reproducibility is something that is sort of core to what makes science science, uh, it isn't something that's easily represented uh, in daily practice. Uh, so both of those and a few other papers are right now under evaluation for a potential special issue at science, uh, but we don't have uh, the editorial feedback uh, for that yet. Uh, so let me just mention what sort of the, the accumulated literature has decided are many of the challenges uh, facing researchers for improving reproducibility and openness in their research, and then talk about uh, transition to talk about some of the things that we're trying to do. Uh, so there are many different things that have been identified. But you can summarize them uh, relatively effectively like this. Uh, so selective reporting. In my lab, we do lots of studies. Uh, not all of those studies produce results uh, that are likely to be accepted for publication or survive peer review uh, because they're messy, uh, they're uncertain, uh, we get a null, uh, and so uh, we're incentivized to get positive, novel, clean results, and if we have a lot of stuff that's messy because we're studying things we don't understand yet, then we can selective, selectively report just those things that look relatively clean and ignore the things uh, that are a mess. Right. And one way to improve our likelihood of publishing is to ignore the null results. Those ones aren't informative, we can't learn from them, so I'll leave those aside. Making the published literature rosier uh, than it actually is in terms of research. I pointed out the flexibility that we have in analysis. The same data may be analyzed many different ways. Some of those outcomes are better, uh, make it more likely for publication, and so I may reason to myself, oh, that really is the right way to do the analysis, not that other way. Uh, even though that's actually motivated reasoning. I'm coming up with justifications that the, the clean result, the good result, is the right way to analyze the data rather than the one that doesn't show the right kind of pattern. Uh, and then uh, replication is not something that's valued, right? Novel research, innovative results, is the engine of scientific progress. We're always aiming for that in our lab, but that's a hard thing to achieve, true innovative results. Uh, and we're not incentivized to try to repeat results and gain confidence, improve uh, verification of those results. Those are not as easy to publish. So all of those things are issues facing the researcher in terms of how we prioritize our time uh, in pursuing research. And then there's a number of other elements uh, that end up having implications for reproducibility as well. Uh, and all of these are things that my lab, and I'm, I hope many others, I know many others, uh, face as well, which is, we're working on a lot of different things. We don't have the, we have ad hoc organizational schemes. People are coming in and out of the lab and they each have their own organizational system uh, and they don't always mesh together. And when someone leaves the lab, then all of their knowledge base uh, leaves with them, right? So we end up losing our own materials and data for our own use 
uh, and we're not consistently sharing those materials in order to help others do the same kind of research that we do. Now, obvious things that can solve the latter issues are things like curation. Uh, but curation is something that when you say that to a researcher, they say, what are you talking about? And can we end this conversation now? Uh, so they aren't the priorities of the everyday researcher because they're not part of getting the research published. Uh, and publication is the currency of scientific reward. So if it's not fitting into the workflow to help me get published, and it's not something, even if I like it in concept, that I can prioritize in practice. And so a lot of the barriers to reproducibility are both the things that were incentivized in order to get good results, but also the things that we're not incentivized to do to make those results, those data, and the workflow behind it more accessible to others for evaluation. Uh, so let me uh, briefly talk about uh, sort of what the the normative or the values context is here, and then start to get into some of the practices. Uh, so Robert Merton, sociologist of science, talked about the norms of science, what science is trying to do. Uh, and he summarized them this way, right? So one norm of science is communality, the open sharing of information so that when I make a scientific claim, you can say, how is it that you got there? What's the evidence? What were the materials that produced that? So that you can evaluate it, extend it, critique it, or otherwise whereas the counter-norm is being secret and closed. Right? Another norm is universalism. Researchers evaluate the research on its own merits versus the counter-norm of just saying, well, that person's famous, so I believe what they say. Uh, disinterestedness. Researchers are motivated by knowledge and discovery versus self-interestedness, treating science as a competition, trying to beat the person down the hall. And organized skepticism is another familiar one. Right? We consider all new evidence, even that, against our prior work, versus organized dogmatism, right? I found something, I have a theory, and so I, I spend my days defending it against the attackers uh, in order to have my theory uh, survive. Uh, and then one that uh, Merton didn't discuss, but is a common one, is a norm of quality emphasis over quantity emphasis. So these norms are readily recognizable of what science is, uh, and when you ask researchers, what do you endorse? What do you think is the right way to do science? Those norms are, the norms are endorsed very readily over the counter norms. So this is a cumulative plot of a survey of more than 3,000 uh, early and mid-career researchers, early career being at the essentially postdoc level, mid-career being an NIH R01 first-time awardee, so about an average age of 40. Uh, and so what you see in gray are the percentage of people that in, endorse the norms over the counter norms on average, and in black are those that endorse the counter norms over the norms on average. Uh, whereas the gray hatches are people that said, oh, both of these are important for science. So that's what they endorsed, and then the researchers said, that's fine. Okay, don't tell me what you believe. Tell me what you do in your daily practice. Uh, and it looks like this. So still, over 60% of early and mid-career researchers saying, I do practice by the norms of science, whereas some more of them, but still very few, saying they practice the counter norms over the norms instead. So then the researcher said, okay, that's great, that's great. Don't tell me what you do. Tell me what your colleagues do. <laughs> and it's like that. So researchers are very skeptical of what their colleagues are doing. They're out there just trying to advance their careers. They're cynically keeping their materials and their data and everything else secret, whereas they themselves would like to behave according to the norms of science, be open and skeptical and just trying to figure out what's what. Uh, Anybody that knows anything about behavior, there's gap in perception. What I believe should be the case, what I think I do, versus what I think everyone else does, is a very difficult situation for behavior change. If I think that everybody else in my community is doing whatever they can to get ahead, and those things will help them get ahead, they're more likely to get the job, they're more likely to keep the job, they're more likely to get the awards, then me living by those ideals is a very difficult thing to do because the decision that I'm making is if I'm going to live by my ideals, it means my career is going to get disadvantaged. I'm not going to get as far along in the process because everybody, I perceive everybody else to be doing it a different way. Simultaneously, almost everyone does endorse those norms. So the same people that are endorsing the norms are perceiving that everyone else isn't endorsing or behaving by the norms. And so we have an opportunity to try to shift people's practices by leveraging the fact that there is a community of shared values. And so it's a matter of figuring out how do we make those shared values something that are evident to others, 
and part of routine practice that people are incentivized to do. If it's not in my incentives to share my data, then it isn't worth my time to share that data, especially when I think no one else is going to bother doing it. And so we need to align those incentives if we want to encourage those practices. And because the values are already there, we can accelerate adoption of those practices very readily. So for us, the key challenge in solving some of these uh, barriers to reproducibility is that the incentives for my success are focused on me getting it published, not on me getting it right. And if we can align those things, that getting it right is the thing that I'm aiming for, that I'm rewarded for in my daily practice, then I'm more likely to do the things that we would say are the core values of what science is all about. Okay, so that's the uh, interlude of just sort of putting the context for researchers' everyday behavior. Uh, what I want to do with the rest of the time is talk about the things that we're trying to do uh, with the Center for Open Science to facilitate this. And really, the value of a meeting like this for me is that we are a service-based organization, uh, and we're trying to provide services for groups like you uh, and the groups that you represent uh, to try to help facilitate researchers adopting more open practices and more reproducible practices. So as Emilio mentioned, we are a nonprofit tech startup, uh, and, and it means both of those things are very strong in, in how we operate. We move very quickly. We have uh, products and service orientation. We have to meet uh, sort of uh, deadlines and get outputs and keep moving stuff out the door, just like a tech startup. And we are just like a nonprofit in that we make no money at all, right, with anything. Uh, but we are mission-driven, so we're aiming to improve openness, integrity, and reproducibility of scientific research, and we have three different primary groups with which we do that. An infrastructure team, about two-thirds of the 70 staff uh, are software developers of different kinds or part of the uh, technical team. Uh, we have a community team that I'll focus a, a number of the comments on in terms of trying to change incentives uh, and norms and working with the others in the community to pursue that collaboratively. Uh, and then the meta science team doing research on scientific practices, and I just summarized some of the data uh, from that team. Okay, uh, so the approach that we take uh, is to try to meet researchers where they are. Right, the the research the grad students in my lab have a job they need to get uh, and research they need to get done, and asking them to behave toward the ideals. Look, everybody endorses the ideals; just start doing it uh, is a big ask. Uh, because there is a lot of effort involved in trying to transition one's practices to do those new things. So what we're trying to do is build tools that provide value for them today with the practices and workflow that they operate on today, and then make it easy for them to transition to a more open and reproducible practice. And so the means with which we're doing that is trying to develop the technology to enable them to change their practices, a technology that provides value for problems that they face now, uh, and then training for how to enact that change. If I want to do more reproducible research, how do I do it? What are the different things I need to do statistically, organizationally, with my methods, et cetera? And then can we nudge those incentives so that they embrace those opportunities for change, see that it's in their interest to pursue that, uh, rather than they just told me to do it because they say it's a good thing to do. Uh, and even if I believe it's a good thing to do, I just can't uh, put the time in uh, to do that. Uh, so the main element for the first phase is the open science framework. And you can go right now and sign up, osf.io, uh, and create an account, and then you can see what the open science framework is all about. Uh, like everything else we build, it's a free uh, open source infrastructure. We're not developing intellectual property of any kind that we uh, own or, uh, or hold on to. Uh, it's all freely available for use uh, by anyone uh, and open source. Uh, so the Open Science Framework is essentially project management for researchers, and I'll give you the view uh, from the researcher uh, first, uh, and then it's also infrastructure that aims to provide back-end support uh, for journals and other service providers. So if journals want to encourage their researchers to uh, share more data, to uh, register their hypotheses in advance, to do other things to improve reproducibility, we can provide services uh, through the OSF for those activities. Uh, so one of the main things uh, that it offers is a means of collaborating, documenting, and archiving one's research at the daily workflow level. So the researcher starts their projects and creates, uh, a, they, you know, they log into the OSF, uh, they say, I want to create a new project, and then they give it a name, 
They add some collaborators, and then they start to store their materials as the project proceeds from conception. Uh, and so it is a place that is the common uh, place in the cloud so that none of them will ever lose their research again. What happens to me regularly before we had this infrastructure for our own lab is that once a grad student leaves, lots of knowledge and actual material leaves with them, and it's very hard to recover. Now every project has a space on the OSF, and so even when a grad student leaves or a collaboration ends or something else happens, I know where to find everything. And one person is not the central uh, decision maker of whether anything survives or not. It survives. It's there. We're all connected to it. And so we can use all of this privately uh, just to help us manage uh, our workflow. The second element that it has is version control in that everything is versioned. Every file that we use uh, can, when we put a new version uh, on the OSF, the old version is retained and then we can see the version history. And lots of researchers, and perhaps you, uh, if you're not a researcher, have lots of ad hoc systems for version control. So, for example, uh, a very common one is when one is authoring a manuscript, when you're about to make a big change, uh, you change the name and add a date at the end or some initials. And so you end up with a folder with files that are final one, final, final one, final, final, really final one, uh, BAN, uh, right, or whatever it is. Uh, that's great. Uh, it's very ad hoc and it's hard to track. Uh, this just does that for you. Leave the same name and keep putting the new version in uh, and it updates it and you have that entire history. Uh, another important element is that it, OSF merges public and private workflows. So most uh, practices of data sharing when researchers are doing it are things that come up after the entire work is done. I have finished my project and now I have to think separately about now making it available uh, to others. Uh, and so all that does is append new work onto the process that for me it's already finished. I wrote the paper. I don't want to have to go back and do more uh, with these data. Uh, by merging the public and private workflows, the researchers are working on their projects in the same system that they make it publicly available in. Uh, so every project has uh, a button up at the top, and you can organize your project into components, uh, and it says make public. And if you click the button at any point in time, it says, do you really want to make it public? Uh, and then if you say yes, uh, then it's publicly available. And you can selectively make public different parts of your project. Uh, so that you can all, you can just share the materials if the data can't be shared uh, for ethical reasons or otherwise, uh, or you just aren't ready uh, to make those things available. Uh, so we're trying to give researchers the flexibility to make it very easy to transition to the public for stuff that they're just working on for their own work as they do it. Uh, it also has some incentives for openness, some reasons for people to see that my research is having impact. Why would I make things available? Well, because we can count how many people care about the things uh, that you make available. So how many people are downloading uh, visits to the page, and then other things that come from uh, the software industry, especially in open source, of how many people are using the things that you create. Right? So the concept of forks is a common one in software development, which is if a researcher develops a new tool, a new method, uh, and others say, well, that's a very cool method, but I have a new way I could, I could change it in, the, in some way. Uh, it's for my own purpose. Well, it can create a fork, which is essentially taking a copy of your method uh, and that component in the OSF and then dropping it into their own workspace. Uh, and then it retains a link to the original, which is essentially a functional citation. They took something that I had built uh, and, and made modifications to it. And then a third person sees what they did and forks that into their workflow and makes additional modifications. And now suddenly there's a network of uses, of functional citations of that original project and we can map how it is that that stuff gets used and changed over time so that you can get credit not just for the material, uh, the report itself, or even just citing the data itself as a means of uh, citation, but you can actually get cited for the different materials and how they get used uh, through these kinds of mechanisms. So OSF also offers persistent citable identifiers, so every uh, project, every component, every file has a unique identifier, uh, like at the top, it auto-generates uh, citations, uh, and then you can generate uh, DOIs uh, as well for different uh, pieces, uh, particularly for registrations. Uh, the concept of registration is uh, marking uh, the project at a particular point in time. 
there are many different parts of the life cycle of a research project that are important in some way. And so you might want to create a, a snapshot, a frozen version of what the project was like at that particular time so that you can revisit that or show people what was happening at that part of the project. And so when you register a project, it takes uh, that project and creates a frozen version with a unique persistent identifier uh, that timestamps uh, exactly what the project was like at that particular point in time. Uh, and that's what you can generate a DOI for. And so common reasons uh, to register a project are uh, at the onset of data collection, I might want to know exactly what the state of the project was, what the materials were, and what my hypothesis and analysis plan was for those data, because I had a strong test, strong confirmatory test that I wanted to do on the data. And so by creating a timestamp version of it, I can always refer back and say, yeah, what we reported in our results is exactly what we were planning to do. This wasn't a product of a adventurous analysis. It was just the analysis that I planned. And so that frozen version certifies that. Another point in time for registration would be upon publication. Uh, this is the state of the project when we published uh, that report, but we're still doing stuff with the data, with the things that we were working on there. And so the project allows us to keep doing new things while still having a frozen version uh, that can be linked to uh, those reports. Uh, and then the most important part, really, of the OSF and sort of the direction uh, of where it's going is that it's connecting the service, services that researchers use. Uh, so the, the long-term uh, vision for the OSF is really just a means of uh, putting together all the things that a researcher uses while they're doing their research. They have to act, interact with lots of different tools for data analysis, for data visualization, for data storage, uh, for, uh, for authoring. Uh, and each of those tools has transition costs from leaving one and getting into the other. So with API relationships, application program interfaces, which is sort of what the modern web is being built on, uh, we are managing the relations between all of these different services. So the idea is, is that each different service doesn't need to figure out how to connect with all of the other services in the world. They just need to learn how to connect with the OSF, and the OSF manages all of the relations. And so here I'm just showing you in a single file tree uh, uh, connections with GitHub accounts, uh, Amazon Simple Storage Service, which is a cheap service for storing large data, uh, Figshare, and Dropbox. So this researcher has a number of different services they use, and they can interact with all of those services at the same time in the same uh, workspace. Uh, and just last week, uh, we added the functionality that you can just move stuff by dragging and dropping across your different services. So that's a nice addition for them. Uh, so the idea is to connect at the abstract level to all of those services that are represented in the life cycle of a research project. So when a researcher is developing an idea and turning it into a study design, they can interact with the services that then transition that into applying for grants, acquiring materials, collecting the data, where that data gets stored, uh, having where that data is stored, uh, interact with their analysis tools uh, so they can stay in that spot. They don't have to pull it out and push it back and move it around. Uh, and then push that right into the publication pipeline. So if the OSF can be a means to uh, get that entire workflow right into the publication pipeline, then, for example, reviewers could have more access uh, to the data and the workflow behind it without any additional effort uh, by the publisher or the, the journal. Uh, and likewise, uh, those data and those materials and the registrations can be easily linked uh, downstream. So there are many different services uh, that are represented in that life cycle. And obviously, these are just a selected example of them. Uh, and so the, the direction is for the OSF to provide these interactive links. Uh, you link to the API uh, through the API with the OSF, and then you have access to link to all of these other services. And a number of these uh, are already linked, uh, and we've been talking with uh, Meredith and Todd about getting Dryad done uh, in the next few months, I hope. Uh, so we'll see how quickly that can get done. Uh, but we're working with a lot of different groups uh, to start to connect these services together uh, through uh, the OSF. Uh, okay, so to give you a sense of where this is, it is a publicly web uh, available application uh, interacting with the, uh, with the Internet, OSF.io. Uh, there, we should hit 10,000 users maybe this week, uh, and there are currently 12,500 projects. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you know, of only a portion of those are publicly available. Most researchers are using this as their private 
uh, workflow for doing their research as they do it. And maybe someday they'll make this public, maybe they won't. So our goal is not to impose uh, the ideals on people, but enable people to exhibit those ideals if they choose to. Uh, so if they don't make it public, that's up to them. That's fine. Right. And the registrations tool has been used almost 2,500 times. Okay, uh, how much time do I have, just so I can calibrate for the next part? As much as you want. <laughs> Fantastic. So you're going to have to drag me off is really the, what's going to happen. All right. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the incentive challenges because uh, researchers are embedded uh, in a system of many different incentives that encourage uh, productive behavior. Productive behavior is good. Uh, but also behavior that's rewarded for very particular activities focused largely around uh, publication. And so to address those, it is a coordination problem. Many different groups that are playing a role in driving those incentives need to work together uh, in order to nudge those incentives. And they aren't big changes in practice that are needed. Uh, they're really just tweaks, but they're tweaks that are more universal. So it really is cultural in the sense that the changes have to be across the system uh, rather than uh, in any particular domain or else they won't be effective. And so I just want to give a couple of examples of things that we're working on uh, that nudge those incentives, make it easy to uh, make some changes uh, that hopefully would help researchers align their own values with their behavior. Uh, so one of those is badges. Uh, badges that, um, uh, that are on uh, publications when the researcher makes their data available, their materials available in a repository, or they pre-register their research in advance of conducting it. Uh, so badges are a very simple thing, uh, and many people's first reaction when they think badges is either Girl Scouts or badges. I don't need those thinking badges. Uh, but badges provide a very simple and easy thing uh, for signaling behaviors uh, that are valued behaviors, and that is just surfacing them. Uh, when people do these behaviors, they're doing something extra than what is currently rewarded by the system. Uh, some people are willing to do those things and do them regardless of whether they get any credit or not. But by signaling it, uh, they feel a little bit of credit. They feel some acknowledgement of doing that behavior. And then others observe uh, the behavior. And so by observing that other people are doing that behavior that we recognize as a valued behavior, breaks down a lot of the barriers to adopting the behavior oneself. Uh, so uh, the journal Psychological Science adopted badges uh, in January 2014. Uh, and, the, uh, and what happens is this is the TWIPS, This Week in Psychological Science. I get it by email once a week. Uh, it's just what the latest articles are. Uh, and journals that are, or authors that have earned those badges uh, that follow the specification for the badges get the credit right there uh, on the front of the article. You can see the little badges there. Uh, and so people know this is one where if I go to the article, I'll be able to find the data uh, or the materials. And lots of them use uh, dry uh, and other uh, repositories to store those data. Uh, so just this little thing, adding a badge, uh, has been quite effective in increasing the rates of data and material sharing in psychological science. So in, in, the, in the year 2014, there were about 140 articles accepted at Psych Science. 36 of the teams applied for uh, one of the badges, one or more of the badges, and about 32 were awarded uh, one or more uh, of the badges on their publication. Now, this is 32, so you know, almost 25% of journals uh, get, or of authors earning a badge, uh, which is up from near zero in this journal, doing any data sharing and material sharing prior to that date. Uh, so just a simple acknowledgement, not Psych Science saying we're going to require data sharing by everybody that publishes in our journal, just we're going to acknowledge it. We think this is a good idea, the journal's signaling that they value it, and here's the credit. Went from zero to 25% sharing uh, in a year. Uh, so this is, that's a, a very easy, low-cost, low-risk thing for journals to do. Uh, another example, which is a more effortful one, but also has an interesting twist on incentives for researchers, is the concept of registered reports. So this is the cartoon version of, register, of how research gets done. Right? You design a study, collect and analyze the data, write the report, and publish it. But of course, there is that barrier, uh, which is peer review, getting in the way of the report getting to publication. And so for when we do research in the lab, uh, peer review is essentially just a barrier to what I want. Uh, and so what I need to do when I'm writing the report is write it in such a way to maximize my chances to get through peer review to publication. 
And the things that matter at that stage are the quality of the results, the impact of those results. Uh, but the results are the thing that I'm not supposed to be able to control. Uh, those are just supposed to be the outcomes. The things that I control are the design of the study, the question that I ask, the creative and innovative ways that I ask that question. And so what registered reports does is just move peer review to the design stage. So you design a study, you develop the protocol, you describe how you're going to do the analysis, you justify why it's an important question to ask, uh, and then you submit it to the journal for peer review. The journal gives a conditional acceptance, or not, uh, but if they give an in-principle acceptance that if you follow through with your methodology and you show that, in fact, uh, the methodology was implemented in a way that provides interpretable results, then it will be published regardless of outcome. So the big shift in incentives for the researcher is that it's no longer the results that I have to prioritize making as beautiful as possible. It's the design that I can have to make as beautiful as possible. And that's good because I, I should have total control over design. Uh, and the results are what the results are. And so this changes the biases about no results, about trying to make beautiful results, about having flexibility analysis, and focuses people uh, on the things that they are supposed to have uh, control over. And so there are 16 or so journals that have adopted this uh, as a submission option. Uh, also, all of them except for one retaining uh, the standard way in which we evaluate uh, uh, articles for publication. Uh, one of them, comparative res comprehensive results in social psychology, this is their only submission option. The journal is trying to do registered reports universally. You can only submit research that you haven't done yet uh, for publication. Uh, and we did a, a special issue of this uh, last year, uh, testing it out to see if it was viable, and it was a very successful run. So I'm happy to talk about that more later. So, so I am just going to keep talking unless someone tells me it's soon to, to stop. So how much time? Oh, that's tons of time. Five more minutes, and then I'll talk for ten more, and then maybe ten more after that, and then you can ask some questions. But, okay. Okay. <laughs> Five more minutes I can do. Uh, okay. Uh, I know Brooks uh, mentioned the top guidelines earlier, so I just want to reinforce uh, that and add a little bit of information. Uh, this is another um, effort to try to uh, connect these many different efforts uh, of how is it that journals can promote uh, transparency in reporting, uh, in data sharing, uh, in making materials available, of uh, showing that if they did pre-register, that they pre-registered, et cetera. Uh, and the top guidelines uh, came out of a meeting uh, that we hosted uh, with Science uh, in November this past year. Uh, and then work committees and some uh, work after that. Uh, and the result is a set of eight standards. I only list them as uh, six here, but there are eight uh, total standards uh, for uh, template text that journals can adopt uh, to uh, promote transparency in their author guidelines. So what, is, what kind of text can they uh, produce to say what the data sharing requirements are, material sharing requirements are? So we consolidate a lot of different information from different efforts that have been doing this to come up with these eight standards, and we have them as eight separate standards so that they're modular. Uh, and they're modular because different disciplines are at different places with these issues. So in uh, economics, for example, there's a lot of discussion uh, about pre-registration and pre-analysis plans as a potential way to increase uh, the credibility of the research uh, that they're publishing. Uh, but pre-analysis plans is barely a conversation, may not even be a part of the discussion at all in some other fields, where there is a very mature discussion about data sharing. Uh, and psychologists are really reluctant to think about data sharing, and so, but they are thinking about some of these other things. And so they're modularized so that journals can assess where their discipline is at, what their particular needs are, and adopt only those standards uh, that are relevant uh, or at are appropriate for what they're trying to do uh, in their journal. And at the same time, there's another level uh, or another uh, dimension, which is each of the standards has three levels of adoption. Uh, level one, which is easy to adopt, low cost, uh, doesn't actually require additional resources for the journal to do anything. It just provides uh, a standard for what one uh, does for data sharing. Up to level three, uh, which is a very stringent standard, uh, but often requires more work uh, for the journal, more resources and otherwise. 
And the levels are uh, to acknowledge the fact that there are different resources available to impose or promote these different standards, uh, and there's different readiness to do it. So just one example, for data sharing, the three levels uh, of uh, the data sharing standard are level one is simply that the authors must write down in the manuscript whether the data are available or not, and where they're available, if they are available. That's it. Uh, it's just requiring say so. Be explicit about data availability. Not just that we suggest doing it, just that you have to say it. Uh, whereas level three, uh, level two requires data sharing uh, in a trusted repository. And level three, the journal or a third party will actually get the data and then make sure that the data can reproduce the results that are reported uh, in the article. So level three is a lot of extra work, right? That's a whole other element for peer review of actually reproducing the results. And so many journals won't be prepared uh, to go that far, but there are some journals that are doing that. Uh, there are two in political science right now that are doing this as a standard practice. Every article they accept, they completely reanalyze to see if they can reproduce uh, the results. Uh, so we'll see if they can actually get this to be something efficient because other editors hear that and they say, whoa, whoa, whoa that's never going to happen. Uh, but maybe they'll find ways to make it a, a relatively efficient process. So nonetheless, we wanted to represent uh, that variation so that journals can adopt uh, uh, at um, the criteria that are appropriate for them. So if there's any interest in that, I encourage you to go to the top uh, website uh, and also uh, email me if you'd like to join on as an organization or as a journal uh, as a signatory. Uh, the article uh, will appear in Science June 26th, and so our ideal is to get as many signatories uh, prior to that date as possible to have uh, showing that this is uh, being broadly considered by the um, community. And to be a signatory, you don't actually have to adopt the top guidelines. You just have to commit to doing a review for considering adopting the guidelines. So it's a very low barrier to entry uh, for being a signatory uh, with the presumption that that's moving pretty quick and going through an entire review of one's author guidelines. Different journals and publishers require different amounts of time uh, to do that. And so we wanted to make sure it was a low barrier to entry. Uh, but uh, if you want to be a signatory before that date, then that's great, uh, and then we will continue to be uh, uh, sharing the guidelines and adding more signatories uh, past uh, June 26, but that's right now the focus of our attention. Okay, uh, so let me then close, uh, because I think I've used those five minutes, uh, and uh, just really sort of what our ultimate goal is, is to try to address this perception gap. Researchers themselves would like science to operate in an open, reproducible way. They value those things, and that's probably in part why they got into science in the first place. But they don't perceive the scientific community to be operating that way. And they don't perceive that they themselves could survive and thrive by, uh, by living uh, as an open uh, and reproducible researcher. And so our measure of success would be if those perceptions of what is incentivized and valued by the community, not by, just by oneself, become aligned uh, so that people can behave according to their own values in trying to advance scientific knowledge. So I will end with that, just acknowledging uh, the many uh, important contributors at the Center for Open Science that are making all of these tools uh, and things possible. So thank you for your time and attention. So there are a few minutes for questions. Okay, any questions? Yes, please. Um, so the general was awarding the badges in the center open data. Um, what was the general doing for deciding whether or not to give the badge? That's a very good question. So there is a committee, uh, and it's an open committee, so if you'd like to join the committee, you're welcome to, uh, that maintains the specifications for what open data means in order to earn the badge. Uh, and so th uh, that committee sort of manages that for anybody that wants to adopt the badges, and then they take feedback and revise it if it's not appropriate for some reason. Uh, the journal, uh, the journals that have adopted the badges so far uh, do a sort of a disclosure requirement. So instead of themselves going and getting into the data and seeing that it is the right kind of data, they just have the um, authors assert that they have met the specifications, uh, and then that's transparent. So the authors have now 
their reputation's on the line. I said that I did this. And then they follow the link to see if when they go uh, to where the data are, are stored that there are data there and they look like it. But it's a relatively cursory check. So they're not going deep dive into saying this is a whole extra layer of peer review, but rather pursuing a disclosure model for it. Is that answering the question? Okay. Brooks. Frank, this is a very detailed question, but I didn't understand your soccer analogy, which is you gave them data on number of red cards and demographics and total number of players. Why should there be any variation at all? This is a whole statistical test of whether, whether the number of red cards is different from the expected number. Yeah, so the, the data set is a complex data set which has every play, mat, uh, match pairs of every player and every referee and every game that they appear. And it's about 30,000 or something, I'm not remembering the exact number, about 30,000 different games. Uh, and, and then whether the person got a red card or not. Red card is a rare event, uh, so there are only, what, 1 to 2% of those particular games and particular matches between referees and players uh, of an event. Uh, so really, it's just a comparison of is there a greater proportion of red cards uh, for players with, that are rated separately as having darker skin tone than proportion of red cards for those players rated with lighter uh, skin tone. Uh, and so the different models test that in very lots of different complicated ways because there's lots of different assumptions, the hierarchical data, uh, referees nested in uh, players, nested in all that nested in games, nested in leagues. Uh, so there's there's lots of different ways one could analyze the data to see if there is a stronger relationship, greater proportion of red cards of players with darker skin tone than light. So that's the basic. I can talk to you more about it afterwards if you still have questions. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about peer review being done earlier on, so that uh, which is great because then it doesn't matter what your results are, and negative results get published. That's right. One of the things about missing and publishing. Right. And um, what I didn't understand there was if I'm starting a research, um, I'm not going to submit that until I've written my paper. So where where is that coming in? How how does how does that get peer reviewed before I've even got my data to get that? Yeah, so the researcher has to plan to have it be peer reviewed in advance. They have to come up with a design where they say, you know what, I think this is a strong enough design where I want to go through peer review in advance to get sort of that guarantee uh, of publication. Uh, so it doesn't, in most research applications, th this is a prediction because this is it's very new. There's only a few groups uh, that are doing this. But my prediction is that most labs, when they're at the onset of a new research program, aren't going to submit for that right away, right? Because we're in this exploratory space, like, well, let's see what's going on out here. And so what often happens in our lab is we do two or three different studies to sort of get a handle on what the phenomenon is. And then we sort of have a signature study at the end. Uh, and that's, I think, when people may use this kind of mechanism, is that they do that initial exploratory work for a few studies, and then when they think they've got a handle on the phenomenon, they design the study and submit the package for peer review through register reports. And that last study is that signature study. So I haven't conducted it yet, but I, I know the journal welcomes these reports that they will uh, conduct peer review in advance and give me some certification of publishing or not. Uh, and so that's uh, when the evaluation happens. Does that make sense? Yeah. The thing for every science, so the scientists who have all the work, work spaces there, are there many special sciences or is it for the uh, So there's about 70 staff uh, right now, and about two thirds of them are software developers. Uh, so the third or so that are scientists of some kind uh, are a wide variety. So we have, uh, I am a psychologist. Oh, oh, I see. I'm sorry. Uh, so users of the Open Science Framework. Oh, from all over disciplines. Uh, so we certainly have gotten the most uh, attention considering that replication work that we started with in uh, behavioral and social sciences. Uh, 
So I would guess I don't have actual numbers of breakdowns by discipline, uh, but I would guess that that is the, at least the plurality uh, are people from the social behavioral sciences. Uh, but we ha we have projects. If you just look, if you surf the search the projects that are available, you'll see all kinds of different projects across disciplines. Uh, so it is diversifying very rapidly. But it is um, private. I, I can't go into. You can surf all the public projects. So you can, if you just, there's a search bar right up at the top. You don't even have to be logged in. You can start typing in words uh, and stuff will spit out. And while she's going back there, I should mention that it's, there's a related project that we have in partnership with the Association for Research Libraries called SHARE. Uh, and this is an effort to uh, aggregate all of the research events from publishers, from data uh, resources, from registries, uh, into a single pipeline to normalize the metadata, which is totally different across all of these different services, uh, and have a single pipeline producing what are research events that are occurring that anybody can grab uh, from that stream. And so if you go to share at the OSF website, osf.io slash share, you can do research on the 900,000 or so research events that we've aggregated uh, that have come from many different sources. Uh, so before I make this comment, I just want to make it clear that I'm not paid in any way by the Center for Science. Um, and that's fine. But you can be. Um, <laughs> we have to do it about the internet. Um, we met for the first time uh, just before I introduced him. So I've been looking for a way to migrate um, my lab over to some kind of project management software because it's just so difficult to keep track of all the different things going on simultaneously. And um, like a lot of people, we you know, we use Dropbox for just about everything because it's just so easy and I just I was going insane with the amount of, you know, windows, you know, repeatedly. And even then it's, you know, just a bunch of nested folders. And I stumbled on the open science framework and immediately we migrated over to it. It's just sensational because it is exactly what you're looking for. It's um it's really none of my collaborators, there is no chance that they're gonna get on GitHub to start um having their code um, you know, archived and version controlled that way. Um, you know, I was happy to do it. They're happy that I'm happy I'm doing it, but they weren't going to get anywhere near it. Um, and this is a perfect compromise for a research group like mine and our collaborators in that they're happy. You can upload Microsoft Word documents. Um, you know, you, we have the links to GitHub if we need it. Code is on GitHub. You know, we have stuff that's all over the place. It's basically it's as easy to use as Dropbox with a bunch of different subsections on it is just phenomenal. And so I'm going to tell Brian the same thing that I tell his staff and that I told Tim and others when I meet them, which is there needs to be a button on the top right hand corner when you log on that says support the open science framework so that PIs like myself, I mean, I was going to drop 500 or 1,000 bucks on project management software. And you would put a little button that says donate, you know, donate here. You can click and an individual PI can, you know, give you 10, 25, 50 dollars and you'll give me a receipt which then I can turn into my physical office so that it looks like I purchased software by the way, so that John Grant can it. It's incredibly useful because um, this, this is, um, it, it really is not only a phenomenal framework, it's really revolutionized the workflow in the lab. It's made it much easier. The ability to make all the certain parts public and private is really wonderful. Um, but I would say you need to make it easier for the user community um, to help with the price and the cost of building it. Maybe only a small part, but we're happy to do that because it really is a wonderful piece of work. Yeah, it's not. It's on the server of the science web page, not on the open science framework web page. And yes, you can talk to Brian about how complicated it is to keep those things. Um, the two things, you know, what is one, what is the other, the dot IO, it doesn't matter. But it needs to be, you know, when I log into my Open Science Framework page, I would love to have that little button in the top right hand corner. So it really is a phenomenal piece of work. So congratulations and thank you for that. Well, thank you, and, and you can send me an invoice with a plug, and then I will send you an invoice back uh, for the OSF. So appreciate that. Uh, and I'll just note that, uh, you know, that I focused a lot on from the researcher's perspective, just to give you a sense of what our origins are. Uh, but we really do uh, have this as a service to try to provide back-end support uh, for journals and publishers as well. So if that's at all of interest, uh, please ask us about it. We are a repository, but we don't aim to be uh, a repository, but rather a connector of repositories. So we want to provide a pipeline to make it really easy for researchers to get their data into Dryad 
in their or whatever other uh, repositories they use, find the appropriate ones and have that right integrated with their workflow. And thanks for that. I, I have a question about the publication of negative results and your earlier comment about uh, the scientific literature being mostly about positive results. And uh, in one sense, uh, if I pre-register and certify my protocol and the experiment that I'm going to do and my hypothesis, and it turns out that the, the data that I actually collect uh, is negative with respect to that hypothesis. Um, wouldn't I, in many cases, change my hypothesis or my conclusion to reflect the actual data so that my publication eventually would be positive results because it supports a different hypothesis than what I started off with? And would you still consider those to be negative results, or how, how would you? Yeah, that's a very good question, and there's sort of a couple of nuances that make it much more complicated to answer straightforwardly, because uh, there is the statistical negative result, which means no relation, uh, and those are sort of less interesting than positive relations, things that are related, right? The fact that shoe size is not related to IQ, people say, well, I don't care about that. What is IQ related to? Uh, so positive results have an interest value over negative ones. And so in that sense of positive negative, uh, you can't undo a negative. Uh, it's negative. There's no relationship there. Then the other way of talking about your question, it is true that it, this may be an affirmative for the hypothesis that I articulate or, or what I say that, that the evidence supports. And so it's a positive or an affirmative result in that sense of supporting a particular perspective, a particular interpretation. And there is a lot of revision in those uh, in people doing research, right? A lot of the hypotheses that we go into in doing our research in the lab are wrong. And they're wrong because we're studying stuff that we don't understand yet. If we're always right with our hypotheses, we won't have to do the research. Uh, so discovery is a very important element uh, of that process. The challenge with uh, the current model is that we're incentivized to tell just those stories. As if the data that we find, the discoveries that we make, are what we planned all along. That's sort of what, how the, the, story, the narrative of writing an article is, even when they're actually discoveries. They're accidental. They're different than our expectations. And the reason that that's a bad thing is because you can't generate a hypothesis and test the hypothesis with the same data. Uh, you massively inflate your likelihood of false positives because you're leveraging chance. Uh, there's lots of randomness in our data. We're making inferences. And so we're going to discover things that aren't actually there when we allow ourselves the freedom, which we need, we have to have that freedom to explore, but we need to follow up that with that with confirmatory tests, and those need to be clearly distinct in the literature. I think we have time for just one more short one. Sort of a follow-up. Um, so with respect to batches, for the authors, fine, uh, this, my data is open. Um, Yes. Um, how do readers transmit the, the um, negative reputation for that result? Do they download the batch? <laughs> no. That's a nice idea. We don't have that right now, uh, but there is, uh, over time, as these become more widely adopted, we'll add services for reporting, for example, uh, when the badge is not conforming to, you know, the way the data is not conforming to what the badge suggests. Uh, so that the community can easily police uh, such things uh, and at least report them. And presumably, the, all of that would get channeled back to the issuer of the badge. So it doesn't have to just be journals that issue badges. It could be third parties that look at the literature and they say, oh, that data is available. I'm going to give a badge uh, to that uh, particular data set or that particular article that reports on that data uh, because I want to incentivize it. Or people could apply to third parties. And so the, it's the issuer's reputation for how it is they maintain and manage uh, those, the accuracy of those badges that ends up being another element of the community management part of it. Thank you very much, okay. Brian. We appreciate it very much. Yeah, thanks very much for the time. We'll just take about 10 minutes and come back after a, just a quick 10-minute break. Thanks, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.